You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Paul Bradley Carr on the show with me to talk about his brand new book, 1414 Degrees. This is one of the most unique books that I've read this year. Um, I absolutely love it. It uh, has recently been published, so it's available everywhere now when you're hearing this. Um what an exceptional trip through uh, a a modern take on on a murder mystery thriller, and I love it. I know you will too. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you, Hank. That's uh, that's a really kind intro. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Absolutely, um, Paul. You've listened to a few shows, so you know that we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, "What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller?" Yeah, I, I I was thinking about this just before we started because it's it's um I know you ask that question to everybody and I really struggle with the answer. I cannot remember not wanting to be a writer. I I racked my brains for the earliest moment and the best I can come up with was um was just being at the very first school I was at. So I was maybe four years old in the UK and starting um, a school magazine for the school, which again, I was four years old. You know, you know I wasn't one of the older kids. And I started a school magazine. Uh, and it was terrible. I found a copy back at my parents' house a few years ago. It's terrible, but it was just, I, I, I just have always wanted to be a writer and both fiction and nonfiction. I can't remember a time I haven't. I love that. Uh, you know, sometimes you just know it's just uh, it's just a part of who you are. And, um, you know, we, we all come to the craft. Uh, our, our journey is a little different. Um, but, you know, some people you just know. And I, I love that. Uh, Paul, you have a really unique accent. Uh, where do you <laughs> hail from? I'm from I was born in Scotland. I grew up in England and I've been in the United States for 12 years now. So my accent is a it's just a train wreck of different uh, vowel <laughs> sounds. So you'll hear it drift in and out. Um, it's it's technically a British accent, but but I don't know who it's trying to kid. Well, um, you know, I have quite a few Scottish friends and, and people that have been on the show before. And and I have some Scottish heritage as well. Ah. And um, throughout all of these these people that I that I know and have met, um, you have one of the most accessible Scottish accents that uh that I've encountered, maybe, Mo- maybe. mostly because it isn't Scottish. I mean, that's the problem. Is is <laughs> I, I left Scotland quite young, and I went to a, a fancy school in the in in England, and they they sort of tried to bash as much of it out of me. So my dad is very embarrassed by my lack of a Scottish, a true Scottish accent. <laughs> well, you know, not to disparage the Scots, but uh, you know, sometimes it it can be a little bit of a chore to. It's, to... it's impenetrable. It's it's, <laughs> it's it's just a made up made up words. <laughs> Yes, it can be. It can be for sure. <laughs> so, so Paul, as someone who who just always knew that that he wanted to be a writer, um, what did you do to pursue that dream? Um, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, have these um, these desires to to want to tell stories, and you know, not they aren't really sure how to go about that. And so, you know, you just start upon the journey of life and. And writing has a way of coming back around to them. What about you? Exactly that. Yeah. In terms of being a professional writer, I had no idea how to do that. I don't come from a writing family. I don't come from any sort of background that would get me into it. And so I went to I went to law school. I decided, well, I like words. I like using words to to hopefully change people's minds or 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 at least give them an insight into somebody else's is world. So so I went uh, I went to law school and. I was terrible at it um, because I love words and arguing, but I don't so much like the law um, in terms of the, the actual <laughs> practice of it. So I, I spent my time at law school. This was um, in the late 90s when the Internet was just coming up, writing 
um, writing a website, just writing about things on the web. It would be called a blog today, but in those days, no one really had a word for it. And um, I actually got a phone call out of the blue from a publisher who had read some of the the stuff I'd written and and asked me if I wanted to write a book based on it. So 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 writing professionally found me um, uh, while I was at law school trying to escape, trying to figure out how to how to use words professionally. So. I was very lucky and then I ended up writing for the Guardian newspaper. I, so I came into it through journalism and through a very lucky uh, encounter with a website. Is, is 1414 uh, Degrees your first work of fiction? Yes, um, I spent my entire career doing nonfiction. I, uh, and it was, I, I always, I, I, all I read is fiction. I read very little nonfiction, but I was convinced, I was absolutely certain that I couldn't write fiction. I just had, didn't, didn't know, I was, I was sort of terrified of it. I thought that so people who wrote fiction were these sort of wizards who did this magic that I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> and I, um, and I still believe that, um, but, but um, so I spent my whole life doing nonfiction, um, but we're writing about the same themes as are in 1414, the sort of use of, you know, uh, the, the tech industry broadly, but also, you know, very powerful people uh, oppressing very not powerful people. And it's obviously what journalists uh, like to write about if they're if they're good at what they do. Um, but it was only, uh, you know, about coming up for 10 years ago when I had this story that I knew could only be written as fiction, that I just forced myself to get over this sort of lifelong terror. I had this. I basically had convinced myself that if I didn't try to write fiction, if I never, you know, wrote the opening once upon a timeline, then I could never discover that I couldn't do it. I was sort of this, you know, Schrodinger's author of just, I'm just going to not try. <laughs> and therefore, um, and so, uh, but, but there was this story that had to be written as fiction, could only be written as fiction. And so I, I forced myself to try. And it turns out I, I could have done it. <laughs> so I, I could do it. It was, it was hard. It was still a magic trick. I'm not sure I know how I did, but, but, um, but yes, so I came to fiction just through, through having exhausted all other options. So I'd, I'd like to explore that just a little deeper for a mm -hmm. moment, um, because I, I I know a lot of people who have um, uh, worked as journalists and um, and there's uh, I think um, and and I've heard different variations of, of answers, but um, I would think that working as a journalist would give you some unique tools. Um, that would help you later as a fiction writer. Not that that one equals the other, um, but there there's something about journalism that teaches you to 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 have a unique look at something, to to view the same thing that a hundred other people are viewing, but to take a unique perspective on it. Um, you know, in in larger cities where there might be multiple newspapers, for in, for instance. Um, there may be multiple accounts of the same robbery or car wreck or you know whatever it is that happens. Yet each um, each take on that from each newspaper from each journalist is a little different because they perceive things a little differently. They're they're all the truth, but just from different perspectives or for different angles. Do you feel like your work in nonfiction gave you any particular tools that now help you as a fiction writer? Well, I, I think you're exactly right. It, I think it, it, with journalism, you you do want to understand every side of something and you want to understand why does this thing that, that this person thinks is terrible? Why does this other person think is great? Um, and but also I think journalism. Yeah, journalism encourages your teaches you over, especially doing it as long as I did it to to be constantly trying to understand why people behave the way they do. It is it's it's one thing to say this person went out and robbed a bank. You know, that's a bad thing. But is this yeah. person a bad person at their heart? What makes them? And, you know, it's that thing you hear often people say, you know, everyone's a hero of their own story. So what makes and actually it's funny. I've been writing about Silicon Valley for, for nearly 20 years, and I particularly focus on the, the sort of the bad side of it. And increasingly, that's that's the most prominent side. But when I started, people didn't really understand that tech, the tech industry could possibly have a downside. Um, but but one of the challenges I had with with writing fiction was I was writing about characters who I, you know, I knew versions of them in the real world and they're not very, I hate to say, it, but they're not very nice people. They're not very empathetic. They don't necessarily care as much about, you know, other human beings as, as you and I. And one of the challenges with fiction is you have to find humanity inside all of your characters. You can't just write a character who is just a bad guy or doesn't really think through what they do or doesn't care. It, it, it feels inauthentic. So, so one of the fun challenges for me was was writing these people who in in real life are actually quite sort of cardboard cutouty in the way they go the, the way they interact with humans and actually finding depth to them finding 
you know, making them redeemable. It was it's a really funny thing. And that's the difference between journalism and fiction is that, you know, fiction has to be believable. And also the characters have to be very three dimensional. And unfortunately, in the real world, oftentimes, you know, it's a struggle to find that <laughs> that redeemability in people. So, you know, that was a, that was a fun challenge. You have spent uh, quite a bit of time covering Silicon Valley and the the high tech industry and the the uh, you know that that unique culture and uh, and fourteen fourteen degrees uh, definitely um, uh, benefits from from that time that you spent there. What how do you feel that this kind of subculture uh, in the world this this tech industry that has kind of built into a whole community and a whole way of life for a lot of people how, how do you think that that existence is kind of separate from the the existence that you know the rest of us in the world live in it's so interesting isn't it, it, it for, and for years it was very distinct i was very aware you know 10 15 years ago when i was writing about the internet and people and things that happened on the internet i was very aware that it was a different universe it was it was like going into a in, into a story where the you know it's a, it's not real it's it's fiction you know almost um it's been interesting in the past 10 years to see how what used to be this very distinct you know cyberspace or whatever it used to be called has become the real world how how things being done and said on social media have very real consequences you know sort of international consequences um and and how you know the ability of these platforms um to to shape our reality has has become so powerful to the point where you know tech billionaires now are are more powerful than politicians they're more powerful than 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 any any other sort of you know wealthy and powerful person in 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 history probably because of the reach they have and the ability they have to to change our thoughts it's a really it's a scary but fascinating thing to because because yeah for so long tech and the and silicon valley was this sort of this other weird you know, subculture, as you say, or, or, or it's a weird universe that, that didn't have consequences. And I think a big part of what we're seeing as well is, is these incredibly powerful tech people coming to terms with the power they suddenly have. And I think that's, that's such a ripe thing for fiction as well is, is, is I think, you know, a lot of these tech founders and tech CEOs were used to being very powerful in a way that didn't really have that many consequences. And now suddenly a decision they make about a line of code can decide if 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 potentially millions of people live or die when it comes to you know healthcare information or political information, you you can you can start wars with a line of code. It's it's a fascinating thing. Dabble is a proud sponsor of Author Stories. Dabble is an easy to use cloud based writing tool that gives writers a way to organize, plot, and create amazing stories wherever they are. Write in our desktop app on your Mac or Windows computer, tablet, or mobile device. Dabble syncs your latest version with the cloud on all your devices. Write anywhere and anytime inspiration strikes. We got you. Dabble is my preferred writing tool, and I think it will be yours as well. Visit DabbleWriter.com for your free trial. You have an amazing story idea. You execute the writing and editing flawlessly, and now the only thing missing are readers. We can help you go from author to author superhero with Story Origin. Story Origin is a one-stop shop for marketing tools with a community of amazing authors working together to find reviewers, build mailing lists, increase sales, and collect feedback from beta readers. Everything an author needs, all in one place, from providing review copies or beta copies, reader magnets to ensure you stay connected with readers, easily distribute audio promo codes, universal retail links to send readers directly to the proper point of purchase, or provide direct download links for members of your mailing list. Story Origin has all the tools you need in one easy-to-use site. Use the promo code ASP21 at checkout when subscribing to the yearly plan and you will get 10% off your first year. This code will expire December 31st, so hurry over and subscribe now. StoryOriginApp.com well, It's especially fascinating when something is a, is a subculture or an alternative to it, – it, especially um, – Social media, for instance, uh -huh. um, used to be an alternative to media, uh, 
and now it has become the media. Yes. Uh, you, you know, when when Facebook and Twitter are more powerful than the New York Times, um, you know, potentially, uh, it, it definitely in in the scope and and ability to spread information quickly, um, which which sometimes is is uh, more powerful than spreading something correctly. Um, it, almost it's always, in, sadly. Almost always, yeah. And it, it's really interesting when these power dynamics start to shift and the people that are used to living uh, in the shadows of the alternative now become the mainstream. And that's that's kind of where we where we see the setup for 1414 that, that really uh, starts shaping up. What was your – I love to explore the beginnings of things because at mm-hmm. one point – 14, 14 degrees did not exist in any shape, form, or fashion. And then, uh, you know, uh, and you'll have to explain your creative process in, in a second, but uh, maybe a character walks into the stage of your mind. Maybe you start thinking through the implications of something that you've studied or read or observed, and then the what-if game starts playing. Um, what was that first moment of that's, inspiration where this That's book- exactly you, – you've nailed it. You've ex- exactly how it happened. So um, – the, the what if so um and it actually comes from a real world we just you know i just mentioned consequences of tech it actually came from a real world uh incident which was widely reported i'm not I'm not breaking any news here this was um a few uh, about close to 10 years ago now uh while i was still a reporter and my my partner my girlfriend is is also a reporter and we we work together on stories about a a particular big tech company that everybody listening to this has heard of and probably uses and we wrote about how they had a particularly sort of shady um shady track record 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 when it came to the treatment of of women and 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 minorities on on their platform and and the company reacted by um threatening to a, t- telling a room full of journalists off the record that they were going to spend a million dollars to hire um a a, a, group, a team of former journalists to investigate my girlfriend and I to 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 see if they could find any dirt to discredit our reporting and they said this very openly but they told the journalists we're off the record you're not allowed to report this and so it's this incredible situation where one of the journalists ben smith at, at buzzfeed um said no i'm, I'm not going to keep that off the record a, a, a multi-billion dollar corporation just threatened to hire a team of journalists to to investigate other journalists in order to discredit their their accurate reporting on this company and he wrote a story about it and he, got a lot of attention and people were rightly outraged. Um, but but when I heard about this, when I heard what, what this company had threatened to do, the, the bit that I got obsessed with was that he, the, the guy had said he was going to hire a team of journalists to, to do this, to do this smear operation. And I thought, what journalist, what, ju- how, I couldn't imagine a journalist taking that job getting a call from this big tech company and they say, hi, we want to hire you to stop being a journalist and become essentially a private investigator to, to try and destroy somebody, somebody's life, go after their personal life if we can in order to discredit them. And all I could obsess with was who is this journalist that's going to get this call and take this job? And it was that what if that, that, that created the character of, of Lou McCarthy, who's the, who's the, the protagonist in the book. I, I wanted to figure out a, um, a, a character who would get that, who would, would find themselves having previously been a real journalist, you know, going after powerful companies, what would make them take a job at one of these powerful companies? What would they have to, what situation would, would have to arise for them to take that job? And that's, and, and she walked onto the page pretty much fully formed. And, and the, the, the story isn't based at all on, on that real world incident, but that character came from that idea of what would make a journalist? And obviously, I saw a bit of myself in that, and people I know. You know, what would what would take a jur- make a journalist? And it wouldn't just be it couldn't just be money. It couldn't just be somebody writes you a big check and you take the job. Something has to have happened in your life that makes you want to take a job um, at this this company that otherwise you would you would despise. So that was and and from that it the book just built. It's you you start with that question, and 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 then you know this entire world. Bill, and you, you've read the book, obviously, the, the story doesn't really have much to do with necessarily that question of a journalist taking the job. It has to do with much bigger questions. But but that was how my character sort of walked onto the page. And then she took me on this crazy adventure. Well, and, and Lou, um, we meet her as this person who um, is at a place that I think a lot of us have been 
at, at at one point or another where she has been fighting the good fight and it mm-hmm. feels as if she has been just tilting at windmills and um you know nothing has come of it and her um personal sense of justice uh, has gotten jaded because no one seems to care and and that is a dangerous place to be that that was such a, a refreshing view on a character who um is a is a person that we want to root for but we can and and she's you know she takes a path that that we might not agree with but we can understand how she got there and i think that's vitally important when you're creating a character is to you know even though they are doing things that that we don't approve of we can understand how they got there yeah i think i think we can all relate to that that feeling of I have done everything right. I have tried to do everything right. I have tried so hard to fight the good fight, as you say, to be a good person. To and 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 you know, stories. We all grew up, or you know, most of us grew up reading stories where if you do the right thing, you you're supposed to, you know, the the bad guys are supposed to lose and the good guys right. are supposed to win. And and we yeah, we meet her in this situation where the bad guys are just winning and winning and winning, no matter and. And she's faced with this uh, this question of like, why am I doing this? Why am I continuing to be the better person or do this, tread this path that I'm told is supposed to lead to slaying the dragons? Um, and the dragons just keep winning and winning and winning and nobody cares. Like, I think that's the other piece. It's, it's I think all of us have felt that from time to time in, in either professionally or personally, that idea of why am I the only one who seems to care that this this situation is bad? I, I feel like I'm fighting and fighting to 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 get justice in this situation and and nobody cares it's just you know is am i just tilting at windmills and 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 yeah that's that's where we meet lou we meet lou at this sort of set moment of despair <laughs> which 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 perhaps in a you know and, and i think you know oftentimes that it takes a few chapters for a character to be that in that despair in novels but i we meet her right out the gate just 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 exhausted and and battered so then um, Lou finds herself in the midst of uh, crazy circumstances where this thing that she personally compromised herself to do now goes south. And um, uh, how did you come up with the, um, the the twist that then puts her in in real danger? So I'll be honest with you. I, 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 you know, I, I always used to hear. I listen to so many, you know, author interviews. I love listening to fiction writers, and and I was always fascinated by people, by authors, when they said, you know, well, the characters just took me in a certain direction. Or, you know, um, I think you you had Lee Child on the show, and he was talking about how he was always only really ever a couple of couple of lines ahead in his storytelling. And I, I could never be a pantser. I was always a plotter. So I had this great plot for a story, and I, and then, um, and then it it just took a life of its own. I wish I could tell you how I came up with, with everything, but, but it just, as I was writing and then rewriting and then reworking, I wrote, um, I, I wrote uh, maybe a third of the book um, and it was a very different book and it went in a very different direction. It was much more sort of linked to that original story question I, ha- I had about, you know, a journalist. And then this, this, this character of fate, which you know, I'm not giving anything away. It's sort of written, it's, it's right at the beginning, this character of fate, this sort of mysterious person who seems to be causing all these uh, very powerful people to die, um, just just walked onto the page, just came out of nowhere, and 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 I discovered that character almost exactly the same way that Lou does, of just like this can't be real. Is this a real person? What is happening here? And you know, I'm not going to pretend then that I just sat and wrote the whole book. You know, it just just off the top of my head, I then had this character and this situation and then went away and 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 spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was going on and what was happening but i wish i could take credit for for creating the the character or the situation <laughs> but it just happened and i just found myself thinking well who is this what is happening why are they doing this how are they doing this and and hopefully it comes across in you know hopefully the the reader has a similar therefore sort of um, you know, challenge to figure out, you know, how are they doing this? Why are they doing this? That I did because I had to, I had to go back and figure it out. Um, fate arrived pretty, pretty fully formed. The the struggle between pantsers and plotters um, is is fascinating to me um, because I, I I am not uh, a detailed plotter uh, by any means. I I just I can't concentrate on the once I start doing that I just 
I, I you know, the wheels just don't turn. Mm-hmm. And then I, I know other people that are strict plotters and they plot out. I mean, just a detailed plot that then they use to write their novel with, and it it acts as a roadmap, and and you know, just things are just bright and sunny for them. Um, and then I've I have other friends who who began as plotters, and then uh, you know, tell the story of of uh, trying writing by the seat of their pants, and it's like their creative life just explodes. And, you know, this it's just sunshine and daisies every time they turn around. Um, it, there's there do you, do you find um, that tension between those two things and allowing yourself to to shift from one to the other? Um, it, is that a good thing for your process now that you're on the other side of it? Do you see that that shifting from one perspective to the other? Um, might allow you to tap into to different um, strengths and, and tools that you've acquired over the years, but then also letting your subconscious mind just kind of run wild. Yes, I, I mean absolutely, and it's funny as a you know as somebody who used to have to write newspaper columns on a very tight deadline. You know, something happened at nine a.m. and by five p.m. I have to have written a, very, a fully formed you know um, a column about it, which has a thesis and and arguments and and you know has to stand up to scrutiny. Um, I, I, I somehow f- was able to, I learned over years how to, how to sort of have a, come to the, come to the keyboard with a, with a thesis. I knew what I was going to write about and I knew what my, 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 my sort of thesis on the, on the column was, and then just trust my subconscious and trust the process that, the to just sit down and, and start to write. And, and I very frequently surprised myself by the end of the column of wow I didn't know that I knew that or I didn't know that, that that was my argument or and it and sort of I was almost having the argument as I was writing and 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 it's been very helpful in in fiction it turns out the same process this idea of I have a plan I know what my story is about and I know that you know broadly speaking this is the beginning and this is the main you know the protagonist and maybe the antagonist and this is the end but then trusting my my subconscious to to not be too rigid and then to just go off and see where it takes me. I think I don't, I don't think I could be, I don't think I either could be a, a, a very detailed planner because it, first of all, I, I don't think that would be fun. But second of all, you know, to me, it is the writing that, that where the creativity comes, it's the writing when these characters introduce themselves or these situations arise. And I, you know, like a, like a dog <laughs> you know, chasing a mail truck. I just want to follow them and see where, where where's that going? <laughs> like, and, and so, yeah, I mean, my, my approach is definitely, have a plan and then very quickly just completely derail it and see where my my um my my sort of imagination takes me. Paul, as as someone that grew up in the seventies and eighties and um you know firmly entrenched in the middle of Gen X, um mm-hmm. you know my generation was the the folks that uh that first used home computers and um were f- the first pioneers on the internet and um y- you know maybe still have uh, a little bit of outdated attitudes about um or or maybe uh we hold things at a at, at an arm's uh, length uh, as opposed to like my kids who you know run headlong into technology and you know adopt all the new things that are, are coming along um it, is this a cautionary tale about um about technology and its role in our life and and how it can um corrupt if not used properly uh or and are are those uh kind of heady things that we think about were those in your mind at all in in writing this or at the end of it do you look back and see okay these are some themes that i see popping up uh that that maybe i was thinking about maybe not but but here they are like um how do you think about you know uh, some people write things um with an agenda in mind, and maybe agenda is maybe too harsh a word um but and there's something sometimes things just come out of who we are does, does that make sense at all it does it absolutely does and 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 so first of all i'm also gen x and i am i i have long argued that we are the we are the luckiest generation when it comes to technology because we remember the before time but absolutely. we also were, were young enough to embrace it when it came along i think we uh and and i i also think that i mean i'm i'm biased obviously but i also think we have a pre- we have about the right attitude which is because we remember what it was like beforehand but we weren't necessarily scared of it when it came along 
we're able to acknowledge that that um, there are incredible things about technology. There are we wouldn't be having this this conversation if it wasn't for technology. We you know we, exactly because during a you know a pandemic, the things that we were able to continue doing with te- thanks to technology, the the things that you know the ways our lives have become easier and better because of technology is is myriad. However the the downsides of it are very very real and they do not have to be this way and this is i think when you if you are a bit younger and you've only ever known technology i think there's this idea that well this is just how it is and 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 because you can't remember how it was you you, you know i i think i think it's easy to just say well you know yeah social media is terrible and and people tear each other apart and we're all polarized and that's just how it is and and it doesn't have to be it is and i think what i'm what I, if I did, I didn't come to the book thinking I'm going to, I'm going to write, you know, send a message to anybody because again, I've done that with journalism my whole life. This, this was about wanting to tell a story, um, but, but I can't help but come from a world in which, you know, I am aware. I, I know these billionaires. You know, I, I've met them. I've written about them. I've spent a lot of time with them, um, and, and I know about these tech companies and I know the decisions they make and it, it, it does not have to be like this. These are conscious decisions being made, you know, to give an example, uh, Twitter, Facebook, they understand that if we are fighting, then then we are, as they say, engaged. You know, there is no engagement like like conflict. You know, if if, if two people are having a very nice conversation, it's very easy for them to walk away and go about their job, uh, their day. If they're having a fight, they cannot stop. They they want to just and another thing and another thing. You know, we've all done that thing where we've had a fight, we've got in the car to go home, and we're still having the fight in our head. And and these technology companies have understood that 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 that's how we work. And and for them, it's like, well, great, we can get people spending more time on our platforms if we encourage fights. It is a deliberate decision to cause these fights. Similarly, it's a deliberate decision to to you know pay people not enough money to deliver groceries for you on a, on an app or whatever it is these are deliberate decisions that do not have to be this way it is not an inevitable consequence of technology so i think if i had any you know under undercurrent sort of going into this it it was this idea of i wanted to to maybe give readers a bit of an insight into how these companies work and how there are real human beings making these decisions that we sort of blame on algorithms it's it's an incredibly human industry that then uses algorithms to to deliver on on an agenda of these human beings. So, I think that's that's what I was trying to say, trying to say. And 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 maybe you know it it really doesn't have to be like this. There are, for the, it can easily shift completely in a different direction. If there is a theme, it's that it's how how little it would take for all of the you know all of the way that technology works right now and social media and sharing economy to just shift entirely and work in a very different way. Now, of course. The, there are, as you know, as you'll see when you, as people will see when if they read the book, is there are consequences on to all versions of it, but but the version we have now is not the only the only version. So, yeah, no, but but again, any Gen Xers listening to this, we are the we are the most fortunate, and we're right. <laughs> trust, I want to like I want to evangelize this. Trust, you are not a technophobe to think that the way that technology is is going is wrong. I used to be the biggest advocate of technology. I spent much of my career trying to tell these sleepy old industries that 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 um that they need to like wake up to, to technology. Technology is a great thing. It's wonderful. But the way it is going when it when it intersects with power and money, it doesn't have to be that way. We can build something better. And that was the promise of the internet, right? It was we were right. going to build this better world and we, I think we still can, not to be too, you know, idealistic, but, you know, it's, but Gen Xers are going to save us from, uh, by having the institutional memory of how technology was supposed to be. 1414 Degrees is available everywhere now when you're hearing this. Uh, Paul, I love this book so much. And and one thing that I think I love so much about thrillers and mysteries is that they are very human stories and there there are lots of different subgenres in in the thriller and, and mystery um genres uh but at the heart of all of them um is a very human story and it's about our conflict between people and 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 how we work out those conflicts and you know the the different genre designations give us new window dressing to the stories if you will um but at its heart 1414 is a is a very human story and and i think that's what i love about it the most um 
thank you for writing the book, and I, I think people are going to love it. I, I'm going to recommend this to everyone this Christmas. Thank you, Hank. That's, that's so kind of you. I really, I, it's my first, as I say, it's my first novel. So, so to hear you say that is, is so kind. And, and I agree, thrillers and thrillers and mysteries. There's a reason so many people are hooked on them. They, there's a there's very few more human genres. Absolutely. Um, tell people where they can find you online, Paul, if they want to connect with you and, and, and dig into all the amazing stuff that you do, because uh, you you have had a, a storied career. <laughs> I've, I've, had, I've done a few things. Um, so paulbradleycar.com is my, my website. I'm Paul Bradley Carr on Twitter. I'm, I'm Paul Bradley Carr on Instagram, although I never use it. Pretty much Paul Bradley Carr will find me wherever I am. Excellent. We'll link up all those places in the show notes as well. Go grab 1414 Degrees today in Kindle Edition or hardcover, however you prefer to read. You can grab it or visit your local bookstore. Paul, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much, Hank. This has been fantastic. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Welcome to historic Sleepy Hollow, settled in 1640. Jason had looped around the town and had come up Broadway from the south. Behind the retaining wall next to the sign, a yard worker turned on his leaf blower, sending a tidal wave of yellow and red up and over the stones to splash off the windshield of the RV. They passed antique shops, a shell station, and a food king grocery. This is the same Broadway, you know, said Eliza. It goes all the way down to Times Square. Used to be an Indian trail, Manhattan to Fort Orange, for the fur trapping business. She kissed the dog. Oh, don't worry, baby. Nobody's going to skin you. And you know what the town's most famous for? Well, duh, Jason said. Every kid named Crane, especially one as tall and skinny as Jason, had heard a lifetime of Ichabod jokes. He hoped never to hear another. Did you know it was a real place? Of course, he said, though he hadn't. Don't be so smart, said Eliza. Turn here. The streets sloped towards the Hudson, the hillside trying to shake the village off its back. Jason slipped in behind a UPS truck and drove upwards. They turned onto Gory Brook Road. He stuck his head out the window, trying to pass. The UPS truck turned aside to the right. And he saw the house. Here! 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 said Eliza. She pointed at the driveway of 417 Gorybrook. Jason brought the RV to a smoke-belching halt. The house stood on a knoll, above a steep yard that angled downwards toward the Hudson. An ancient sycamore on the front lawn leaned precariously. The roof was an irregular A-frame, with a long slope on the left and a short one on the right, like a rotated checkmark. The upper floors were trimmed with bands of chocolate brown wood in a rectangular pattern. They made the house look as if it were trapped behind the bars of a jail cell. A tiny triangular portico extended over the front door, which was rough-hewn, rounded on top, held together by two vertical metal bands, and dotted with nail heads. A gothic novel in braille. The gray-blue curtains at the ground floor bay window gave the place a veiled eye aspect, like his grandmother's cataracts. The house seemed to be inspecting Jason with that eye. What are you doing here, boy? I'm watching you. Eliza put a hand on his shoulder. He jumped. This is it, she said. She slapped the dashboard. This is what? Our new home. But Jason turned to her, baffled. Her face sparkled with delight. Surprise! Surprise! 